I'd never seen a sky that color. Yellowy, black, greeny, purple. It was uncanny. Oh, it was a day and a night that we shall never, ever forget. I couldn't believe that this was happening. First the sky, and then this horrible smell. Really sulfur Thunder and lightning and what was horrible. We're in very great danger you know, from the pollution that's coming down over us. And we've been led astray by the military the industrial complex. dangerous chemicals over us from Is planes. the government experimenting with that's our weather? That's question at the heart of a phenomenon called chemtrails. Chemtrails is now a term referring to the visible attention. trail left by aircraft Millions of tons of toxic poisons it's released by planes during the Cold as part War, of the government the plot to affect military climate change. Conducted the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather, leaving what you see there, and they call that a chemtrail. Geoengineering. They say it puts poison in the soil. High levels Increases of these chemicals, the chemicals in our rain radiation. and soil. It's using planes to spray chemicals into the atmosphere the to manipulate both the soil and the body. And that's why health department no, records show a sharp increase in barium and aluminum in California's water supply. We shall propose further cooperative efforts between all the nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. The Army's need to know more and more about weather that surrounds this planet is a vital part of the expanded research program of atomic weapons. We all talk about the weather. The Army is doing something about the weather. laboratory and show you a few of the experiments that led us to our outdoor experiments in converting clouds into snow. Using our home freezing unit such as this, we can form super cool clouds just like those in the natural atmosphere by taking a tiny piece of dry ice such as this and scratching it so a few tiny fragments fall into the super cool cloud. Long streaks develop. The particles grow very fast. They grow about a billion fold in volume in a few seconds. Many millions of snow crystals form, and we get the same effect as is produced by dry ice. Dry ice is, is not particularly important as far as the fact that it's CO2, but it's primarily important because it's colder than minus 35 degrees centigrade. This is a picture of the first cloud that we see that back last November, flying in a small Fairchild plane and putting dry ice from a small dispenser in the bottom of the plane. And within a minute, saw long streamers of snow falling from the base of the cloud and evaporating into the drier air below. Under many conditions, of course, full-fledged snowstorms will be produced in this way. Nature, at last, has permitted to do a little something about the weather. Using Schaefer Langmuir techniques, the Army Signal Corps and Office of Naval Research began conducting many of these experiments. In 1947, Project Zero 6 expanded to test the cloud seeding on a hurricane traveling eastbound 350 miles off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. They dropped 80 pounds of dry ice into the raging storm, only to realize that the hurricane suddenly changed direction and began traveling back towards the United States. Savannah, Georgia, was hit by record-breaking winds of up to 85 miles per hour. More than 1,500 people were left homeless, and at least two people died. The total damage was reported in the millions of dollars, and the project and its participants were blamed for what happened. On the night of the 15th of August, 1952, the worst flood in British history swept through the tiny seaside village of Lynmouth. 90 million tons of water devastated the area, killing 35 people and leaving over 400 homeless. 40,000 tons of boulders were dragged off the moors, destroying houses and cars. Porters spoke to squadron leader Len Otley. 
He confirmed that he worked on Project or Operation Cumulus, which was also referred to as Operation Witch Doctor. What's more, in mid-August 1952, Alan Yates, a lecturer at Cranfield School of Aeronautics at the time, was asked to take part in cloud seeding experiments. According to Yates, the artificial rain fell over Lynmouth and washed the village into the sea. Newly declassified documents prove that Project Cumulus was indeed going on the day of the flood that year. Project Skyfire, a U.S. forestry research operation concerned with the study of lightning in all of its manifestations. Project Skyfire is aimed at lightning fires in western forest. In detail, uh, the manner in which your uh, work involves you in the uh, dispersion of clouds, which uh, happen to have some effect on, or rather, bring about thunderstorms or what have you. Could you tell our audience something about that type of work? Laurie, we're conducting experiments in cloud seeding, aimed at determining whether or not uh, weather modification techniques might possibly prevent lightning fires. Uh, we carry this on, work on uh, by seeding clouds with silver iodide nuclei. We disperse silver iodide from specially developed generators located either on the ground or on aircraft. Our experience has been that we can do the best job uh, through aircraft seating. Again, man looks to his own efforts to increase the flow of water. Since the 1946 experiments of Dr. Vincent Schaefer, we have known that some clouds can be modified through seeding to yield additional precipitation. In 1961, Congress directed the Bureau of Reclamation to begin a long-range study of cloud seeding with the aim of eventually augmenting the nation's supply of water. The program, called Project Skywater, continues at many sites throughout the United States. Eventually, if the research program proves successful, the methods learned will become part of our nation's integrated water resources program. In 1962, during the Vietnam War, American forces responded with Operation Ranch Hand. Over the next nine years, spraying an area about the size of Massachusetts with defoliants, the most notorious being Agent Orange. Large swaths of Vietnam were left barren. Enough food to feed 600,000 people for a year has been destroyed. Despite this sudden devastation, U.S. officials said the sprain created no lasting harm. Milton Ross, a special forces advisor near Play Coup, has a son born without the tips of his fingers. North Vietnam charged today that defoliants have produced many instances of miscarriages, congenital defects, and monstrosities among children. The Vietnamese government insisted the cause was Agent Orange. Although that war was long ago, there is lingering anger about the United States' use of a controversial defoliant spread by American aircraft on the jungles there. An epidemic of birth defects, brain damage, and rare cancers still affecting hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese today. According to environmental studies, high levels of dioxin could still be found in the soil in certain areas and had seeped into nearby lakes. Agent Orange was a safe product when it was used in the Vietnam War and it's a safe product today. I got something to say. I want to know how come the fascist pigs have been seeding the clouds. Right. The last hour the and airplanes air. going over twice with, the, with, all, with all the smoke coming out of them seeding the clouds. And I want to know, you know, why that stuff is going down, man. And why doesn't the media report that stuff to the people, man? I'm telling you what happened. The planes come over an hour and a half and they seeded all the clouds, dog. People of unknown origin were <laughs> seeding the clouds over the you know, I don't know what they hope to prove, Project Storm Fury assembles a team of highly trained scientists and technicians to fly into mature hurricanes. Scientists working on the project were convinced that they could reduce hurricane devastation using a process called cloud seeding by spraying the thunderclouds inside the hurricane with a chemical called silver iodide. This would become known as the Storm Fury Hypothesis. The seeding planes fly across the eye and into these clouds, seeding the supercooled water droplets from the belt of maximum winds outwards. As the silver iodide turns the supercooled water into ice, the heat released during this process causes the seeded clouds to grow and develop 
into a new outer eye wall. At that time, the United States Army were in Vietnam. Pierre Saint-Amour was part of the team assembled in a top-secret cloud seeding operation known simply as Project Popeye. In May 1967, as monsoon clouds developed over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, Armand and his team put their new weapon to the test. We jetted the material so that it fell into the growing part of the cloud and uh, it rained very heavily out of it and everybody was convinced with that one experiment that we had done enough. Project Popeye had opened the door to a new and dangerous type of warfare. Some said, if you control the weather, you can control the world. Military planners imagined loading the clouds with radiological, biological, or chemical agents and having them rain on demand. They could attack your enemy using the weather, but deny ever doing so. Allegations were made that cloud seeding had not only made jungle paths impassable, it had also killed thousands of innocent people. But this didn't stop governments from continuing to explore ways of modifying the weather. Sometimes, for highly questionable purposes. And that message calls for new frontiers, new visions. It calls for us taking the steps now that will make us no longer second in space and in science. It lays the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather, and he who controls the weather will control the world. It lays the steps that are necessary to provide a nuclear rocket that will produce benefits that are so unlimited that I couldn't tell you about them if I had all that. July 1976. Strange, unexplained blackouts in worldwide communications plague the globe and are covertly transmitting extremely low-frequency waves, otherwise known as ELF waves. It's called the Russian woodpecker because it was essentially that sort of clicking, pecking sound. In 1982, a report by Pentagon researcher El Ponte alleges the Russian woodpecker signal is actually creating layers of artificial ionization in the upper atmosphere, which means it could have been bending the jet stream and altering global wind patterns. There's been a lot of research in military labs over what you can do with, with putting radio waves into the atmosphere. Some of the research indicates that one can move the jet stream around and thus induce weather conditions. It's no coincidence that the United States began building its own mysterious array of antennas. TARP is the high frequency active auroral research project, originally a joint effort of the Air Force and Navy in cooperation with a number of academic institutions. Of 180 antennas, approximately 72 feet tall, linked together to function as one giant steerable antenna. Steerable because it can aim millions of watts of ELF waves into one tiny patch of the atmosphere. HARP is one of several ELF wave transmitters located all over the globe. Working in tandem, these transmitters alter the weather anywhere in the world, potentially changing the jet stream's course entirely. The intense energy being beamed into the sky by HARP sends pulses of ELF waves into the ionosphere the waves get reflected back down and pass through the earth and ocean. But HARP's startling potential doesn't end there. It's linked to a strange phenomena occurring in our sky. On clear days, you can often see long white lines being traced high in the sky. They are contrails of jet aircraft, actually long, slender clouds. Weathermen are finding them especially fascinating because a theory is being developed that those long white lines may be changing our weather for the better. Details from Roger O'Neill. The exhaust from jet engines, usually seen as long, thin trails of white clouds behind high-flying jet airplanes, may be a big reason why there are 30 fewer days of sunshine a year in the Midwest now than there were in 1900. The daily range between high and low temperatures has also narrowed. In the absence of natural clouds, Given the correct atmospheric conditions, jet aircraft in high frequency can almost completely cover the atmosphere with clouds. No one is trying to make clouds now using jet engines, but this study suggests that jet travel is inadvertently making our days more cloudy. 
And someday, weather researchers may be able to use jets on purpose to change our weather. Roger O'Neill, NBC News, Champaign, Illinois. And finally, a federal report today predicted possible catastrophic warming of the Earth by the 1990s with a strong climate change. Hurricane Gloria is moving on the East Coast tonight like a monster out of a science fiction film. 3,000 homes went underwater, and of those, almost 900 were destroyed. From 1987 through 1992, California experienced the most severe drought in the state's history. According to NOAA, an anomaly occurs in the jet stream. The winds appear to change direction, blowing east to west instead of west to east, indicating the jet stream coming into the west is suddenly much weaker than normal, causing a drought. By 1995, the jet stream returns to normal. Here, there were huge problems with flooding. Intersections and parking lots underwater, homes threatened, people trapped in the river that you see out here behind me, forcing those dramatic rescues. This U.S. Air Force report graphically outlines the military's desire to exploit and manipulate the weather for the purposes of war by the year 2025. According to one of the most harrowing lines in this report, quote, weather modification is a force multiplier with tremendous power that could be exploited across the full spectrum of war fighting environments. Man-made global warming is no longer just a theory about climate. It is the defining moral and political cause of our age. It is presented in the media as having the stamp of authority of an impressive international organization. From the, IPCC, the, inter the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. I've often heard it said that there is a consensus of thousands of scientists on the global warming issue and that humans are causing a catastrophic change to the climate system. Well, I am one scientist and there are many that simply think that is not true. The final conclusion are politically driven. This claim that the IPCC is the world's top 1,500 or 2,500 uh, scientists, you look at the bibliographies of the people and it's simply not true. There are quite a number of non-scientists. And to build the number up to 2,500, they have to start taking reviewers and government people and so on, anyone who ever came close to them. And none of them are asked to agree. Many of them disagree. Those people who are specialists but don't agree with the polemic and resign, and there have been a number that I know of, uh, they are simply put on the author list and become part of this 2,500 of the world's top scientists. People have decided you have to convince other people that since no scientist disagrees, you shouldn't disagree either. Climate scientists need there to be a problem in order to get funding. We have a vested interest and creating panic because then money will flow to climate science. It's become a great industry in itself. And if the whole global warming farrago collapsed, there'd be an awful lot of people out of jobs and looking for work. There's one thing you shouldn't say, and that is this might not be a problem. If you go to page 119 of the president's budget, he's anticipating generating $646 billion in new tax revenue from this bill. So clearly the president expects this bill to generate $646 billion in new taxes that even his own budget director has said would be passed on to consumers. So you must have been listening to our testimony that we've had for the last few days with dozens of experts that have come in who have given completely different views. Well, there so are I would, I would, I would encourage you to go back and look at the testimony there, this committee's heard. We're talking about no, that, that can that, export millions of jobs out of our economy, out of our country, and testimony's been given just to those numbers. And so we're talking about a serious consequence that there would be on this country, the carbon would be emitted, but it would be emitted in China and India, and the jobs would go to China and India. So do you want to Man, Man-made global warming pollution causes global warming. It's my understanding that back in 1997, when you were vice president, Enron's CEO, Ken Lay, was involved in discussions with you at the White House about helping develop this type of policy, this trading scheme. And uh, is, that, is that accurate? Is it inaccurate? It's, it's been reported. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but, but I, I met with uh, uh, Ken Lay, as lots of people did, before anybody 
knew, knew uh, that he was a right. crook. And, and clearly, it, you can see why so many of us are concerned about turning over this country's I energy economy. I didn't know him economy. well enough to call him Boy. You knew him well enough to help devise this trading scheme. And obviously, we know what Enron and these big guys on Wall Street like Goldman Sachs. And I know you've got interest with Goldman Sachs. No. And these people, well, it's that's been reported. Is, is that not accurate? No, I... I wish I did. With, I'm saying that there are going to be big winners and big losers in this bill. And I think that should be noted that companies like Enron helped come up with this trading scheme that would uh, be it, Enron. Did, Enron. I don't know if this is true or not, that some scientists are trying to figure out a way to block the sun to try to slow <laughs> yeah. down global warming. Yeah, it's a measure of uh, the feeling of desperation that some of them are feel. Are they really thinking they could do that? Well, if, yeah, some of them are seriously proposing, and I, I think it's completely nuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, you put a, another kind of pollution, sulfur dioxide, up to orbit, the cover the atmosphere, the sky won't be really blue in the way it is now anymore, but it would block out some of the sun's heat uh, so that we wouldn't have to take the difficult steps to stop spewing all this global warming pollution into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there are a lot of problems with what they're proposing. You could actually spray sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, 20 kilometers over our head, and use that to stop the planet warming up in a okay, kind wait, of ugly you, tech fix. You could, you could spray something into the atmosphere yes. to change, okay, spray okay. Spray pollution into the atmosphere to stop it warming. How do you do this? You'd yeah. start with a fleet of modified business jet and say 20,000 tons of sulfuric acid uh -huh. into the stratosphere every year. Uh -huh. And each year you have to put a little more. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't, in the long run, mean that you can forget about cutting emissions. We will need to rein in emissions. No, we'll get to it eventually. Does, but in the meantime, we're shrouding the earth in sulfuric acid. So people are terrified about talking about this because uh -huh. they're scared that it will prevent us cutting emissions. Right, and also that it's sulfuric acid. <laughs> we put 50 million tons of sulfuric acid in the air now as pollution, and it kills okay. a million people a year worldwide. Okay, but it'll be better if we put more in. We're talking about 1% of that. 1% more, we're just killing 10,000 more people. You can do math. What happens to the sulfuric acid after it's sprayed? Does it just stay up there? No, it rains down, okay. but it's a tiny addition to okay. what we're already doing. Is there any possible way this could come back to bite us in the end? It actually turns out to be an old idea. This really? was known since President Johnson. You ever look at those planes up there? They have contrails behind them? Maybe all those planes with the contrails, maybe they're actually spraying chemicals into the atmosphere right now and Uncle Sam isn't telling us. It seems extremely extremely unlikely. The that fact the United the government... States is not telling something to its citizens? That seems extremely likely to me. Read the newspaper. I think they might have your idea already. This geoengineering idea in its simplest form is basically the following. You could put um, fine particles, say sulfuric acid particles, sulfates, into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, where they'd reflect away sunlight and cool the planet. There's lots of mystery in the details, and there are some bad side effects, like it partially destroys the ozone layer, and I'll get to that in a minute, but it clearly cools down. And one other thing, it's fast. I guess the thing I haven't said about this is it is absurdly cheap. It's amazing how we can affect the planet. The one thing about this is it gives us extraordinary leverage. This, this improved science and engineering will, whether we like it or not, give us more and more leverage to affect the planet, to control the planet, to give us weather and climate control, not because we plan it, not because we want it, just because science delivers it to us bit by bit. What is geoengineering? It's really two very different things. One is ways that we would alter the amount of sunlight the Earth absorbs, and so cool the planet, partly offsetting the effects of carbon in the atmosphere, and that's called solar radiation management, or in some technocratic way, SRM. And the other one is to take carbon out of the atmosphere, so-called carbon dioxide removal. Before we get on to solar radiation management, let me ask you about the, the carbon dioxide removal. Um, a Royal Society report here in the United Kingdom back in 2009 said that no method of carbon dioxide rem removal has yet been demonstrated to be effective at an affordable cost with acceptable environmental impacts. And they only work to reduce temperatures over very long timescales. I think that's exactly right. And I can say that both as an author of that report and as somebody running a startup company trying to capture CO2 from the air. Before we get into yeah. the pros and cons of it, how solar radiation management might work. 
Conceptually, it's simple. The doing it is not the hard part, but you could use aircraft or other methods to deliver uh, literally tons or millions of tons of very small reflective aerosols, tiny particles, say, to the upper atmosphere. Spraying them out at, at a high altitude. Correct. Isn't one of the problems with the climate is, and studying the climate is that it's incredibly difficult to know exactly how it works. It is very difficult to model. Con sure, it's, it's impossible to know exactly, but you can still learn a lot. So we actually ran a survey a, almost a year ago now that took data, high quality data, from a thousand people in the UK, Canada and the US to try and understand public support for research on these technologies and you know, what, what kind of political leanings uh, uh, influence people's decision to be for or against. And in fact, we found pretty broad support for research. But that particular opinion survey that you're talking about, it also came up with the finding that 64% of subjects agree that humans should not be manipulating nature in the way suggested by solar radiation management. Exactly. Well, that would suggest that there isn't particularly broad support at the moment for the theory behind this. There's not broad support for doing it, and I think that's quite a healthy thing. I mean, I'm one of the people who, maybe starting 20 years ago, most helped to open the door to get public conversation going on this thing. How do you think, in that case, the public can be convinced, given that there is, as we saw with this project in Britain, tremendous skepticism, even about research at what you say is a very, very benign level, Public opinion will evolve over a long time, and from my point of view, the goal is to try and make that public opinion be able to have, be able to be shaped by facts as well as possible, and also shaped by people's values. It's not to promote this. So actually, so, so well, it, it, it is in part to promote this. I mean, actually, you're a great enthusiast for this, and as you said, you have your I, own uh, private company, which is uh, and my private is, company. We're sourced on a very different part of it, which fine, doesn't suffer it, from these governance challenges. But, but it is all to do with yeah, the issue of geoengineering. Actually, I mean, you know, it's an incredibly sensitive topic. I actually don't think my job is promoting. My job is to help clear thinking and clear knowledge about the tools we have to regulate climate risk. Among them, this one. And I'm perfectly prepared to find that the results show that we should never do this. So, if it works, and again, we don't know it does, it provides some protection in the near term. Isn't there a problem, though, that you could end up with different effects in different parts of the world? I mean, you could, for example, find that although you're reducing the amount of uh, sunlight and the amount, therefore, that the Earth is, is warming up, rainfall is affected in different ways in different parts of the world. Absolutely. Essentially, the, the scientists and technocrats, including myself, I guess, are helping to invent a thermostat knob. But it's much hard, easier to invent the knob than to figure out who should be in charge of it in a world with many states. No, indeed, and I want to come on to the yeah. governance, but I I'm, I'm want to ask specifically about the science of this, which is how far can you tell whether the effects of cellular radiation management are then going to cause perhaps a catastrophic loss of rainfall in a certain part of the world. At the moment, it seems to be hazy, this. I think it's not as hazy as that. So using exactly the same climate models as we've used to estimate the problems with CO2 in the atmosphere, the underlying climate problem, we've applied those same models and same techniques to look at this. And the results so far, I have to say, look pretty good. That's why we're paying any attention to it. Richard Branson himself, who owns the Virgin Airline Group, was quoted back in 2009 in the New York Times saying, if we could come up with a geoengineering answer to this problem, we could carry on flying our planes and driving our cars is going to cost a lot of money. And yet you're, that, you're, I mean, let's be clear here, that, you that, and your company are after Branson's money. The cheapest thing to do is to use the atmosphere as a waste dump. And if we want to stop doing that, we must have laws that restrict the ability to use the atmosphere as a waste dump. My question is, are yeah. you not concerned that you and your, I mean, your company, Carbon Engineering, yeah is looking for money from people like Richard Branson. It's funded, I think, in part by Murray Edwards, who uh, is a key figure in tar sands, which mm -hmm. is seen as one of the dirtiest fuels on the planet. It is. Are you not slightly concerned about the people who you're getting into bed with? I'm happy to take money from serious folks who have a broad set of interests. No problem. First of all, I should say, for work on SRM, on these very high leverage technologies that, that have security concerns, I believe there should be no private action, there should be no for-profit action. I believe it would make sense for SRM to actually restrict or eliminate the possibility of patenting. For Isn't your company involved in several patents at the moment? This is the difference. So for capturing CO2 from the air, that's an encapsulated small technology, which can be regulated by the normal laws. It's inherently expensive, so there's no risk of sucking all the CO2 out of the air because it costs so much. Any technology you have that removes CO2 will have local risks, maybe unacceptable risks, but those risks can be managed by the normal local risk management we have. So I think that I'm happy to see private action on cutting emissions by making solar power or electric vehicles or capture from air. I'm not happy to see public action on technologies with this huge leverage, like putting particles in the stratosphere. I'll tell you a little bit about some new work we've been doing, thinking about how you actually might put 
uh, uh, aerosols in the stratosphere. The novel method we've been thinking about, or it's not novel at all, it's actually exactly what happens from aircraft contrails, is that we put a condensable, a few uh, megatons a year of sulfur would be enough to produce sort of four watts per square meter radio forcing directly out of the back of an aircraft. There's a huge literature in the nanofabrication world about making fine particles from low vapor pressure gas. And there's nothing very hard in terms of aircraft engineering. If you go to aircraft engineers and we've done this, they say, that would be easy, we could do this if you want us to. We've mostly thought about sulfur and there's a lot of good reasons to think about sulfur because sulfur's what uh, uh, nature does, at least in this version of the model. It's as if you put sulfur in continuously, you actually get a remarkably ineffective result. Nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about alumina. The big deal really is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate as sulfur, but roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass flow. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make high quality alumina particles just by spraying alumina vapor out, which oxidizes. So it certainly seems pretty cost effective and easy to do this with aircraft that are not very different from conventional aircraft. High class business jets like the Gulfstream have uh, wing designs that are very efficient. So with slightly different engine choices, they can easily deliver large uh, weights up to sort of 20 kilometers or a little higher. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re-engineering existing aircraft. We have engineering firms that can do it. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, okay, yes, we could do it. Once you realize you can make things by direct condensation from vapor, then all sorts of different compounds are possible. But it's much, much harder to actually figure out the environmental risks and effectiveness of these new methods than it is to cook them up. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk to risk decisions. So the key factors are this is fast, it's cheap, and it's inherently imperfect. It cannot compensate for the amount of CO2 in the air. On a commercial basis, I do absolutely no uh, proprietary commercial work on solar radiation management because I think such work would be uh, wrong. Solar geoengineering refers to a set of technologies that could allow humanity to deliberately increase the planet's reflectivity, and so partially offsetting the temperature changes and other climate changes that come from the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Solar geoengineering can be very inexpensive. The cost might be something like $10 billion for the whole planet. That sounds like a lot of money each year, but in fact that's something like one ten thousandth of global GDP. This next story is so unbelievable, we didn't think it could possibly be true. But after receiving thousands of records and declassified reports from the Army, it's confirmed that during the Cold War, the United States military conducted secret tests on unsuspecting people in the city of St. Louis. Lisa Martino Taylor's life work has been to uncover details of the Army's ultra secret military experiments carried out in St. Louis and other cities during the 1950s and 60s. This study was secretive for a reason. Um, they didn't have um, volunteers stepping up and saying, Yeah, I'll breathe zinc cadmium sulfide with radioactive particles. These Army archive pictures show how the tests were done in Corpus Christi, Texas in the 1960s. In Texas, planes were used to drop the chemical, but in St. Louis, the Army placed chemical sprayers on buildings and station wagons. City officials were kept in the dark about the tests. The Cold War cover story was that the Army was testing smoke screens to protect cities from a Russian attack. Clearly, they went to great lengths to deceive people. By making hundreds of Freedom of Information Act requests, she uncovered once classified documents that confirmed the spraying of zinc cadmium sulfide. The greatest concentration of this compound was sprayed near the Pruitt Igo housing complex just south of downtown St. Louis. It was home to 10,000 low-income people, and an estimated 70% were under the age of 12. Martino Taylor claims they all unknowingly inhaled this compound morning, noon, and night, so the government could measure its effects on their lungs. So this is in violation of all medical ethics, all international codes, and the military's own policy at that time. And Venezuelan leader Hugo Chavez has once again accused the United States of playing God. This time it's Haiti's disastrous earthquake that he thinks the U.S. was behind. Spanish newspaper ABC quotes Chavez as saying that the U.S. Navy launched a weapon capable of inducing a powerful earthquake off the shore of Haiti. He adds that this time it was only a drill and the final target is destroying and taking over Iran. A wild accusation from Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He says Western countries are causing drought in certain parts of the world, including Iran. He says 
They're using high-tech equipment to drain raindrops from clouds. He basically says European countries are stealing rain from Iran for their own use. You know, they were talking about climate change yesterday, and now we're learning that scientists and researchers are looking at how to change the weather on purpose. That's right. Lasers now could one day manipulate rain and lightning. That's right. Well, as Mark Twain once famously said, everyone complains about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Well, instead of doing a rain dance, we physicists are firing trillion watt lasers into the sky to actually precipitate rain clouds and actually bring down lightning bolts. When you have water vapor and you have dust particles or ice crystals, you can precipitate rain. It condenses around the seeds. These seeds can also be created by laser beams. By firing trillion watt lasers, you rip apart the electrons, creating what are called ions, bringing down rain and even lightning. Well, I remember reading the stories that China had used this during the Olympics, that the USSR had used this after Chernobyl to create rain clouds. I mean, w did those really work then? We have some of these capabilities now? Inconclusive. Even in the 60s, the CIA used this to uh, bring down monsoons during the Vietnam War. Governments have been playing with, with this to. thing. Alleged to. Alleged to, right. Yeah. Now, we realize that for decades now, these governments have been alleged to have experimented with weather control, but nothing conclusive. We're actually using trillion watt lasers yeah. now. They precipitate rain out of water vapor. Sure enough, you can actually bring down electricity yeah. down, the, down the beam. The bad news is, if it's a clear blue sky, it's not going to do anything at all because it only takes water vapor that's already in the air and condenses it. However, you name it, outdoor events and agriculture and flooding and even hurricanes, all of them could be subject to weather modification. Now, terrorists no longer the CIA's only priority. The U.S. Intel Agency now investing in weather? Well, they're looking into something called climate uh, engineering or geoengineering, which is a way to manipulate the climate to mitigate the effects of global warming. And they think that maybe this might pose a national security threat in the form of exacerbating water shortages or causing more regional instability in places like Darfur or in India-Pakistan region, in the Kashmir region. So they want to find ways of mitigating climate change. And they're investigating, are there possible ways of doing that? Oh. Scientists have been researching this for, have been thinking about this for quite some time. There are two general ways of engineering the climate. One is called solar radiation management, mm -hmm. which is putting particles into the atmosphere. So like if you think of a volcano, a volcano sure. explodes and it releases particles and that cools down the planet. So that's one way. You can put a balloon up in the atmosphere and spray particles. And then another way would be to possibly bring down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere uh, in a process called carbon capture and storage. They're basically funding research by the National Academy of Sciences. Okay, so the CIA is not trying to control the weather. We've tried that before and it doesn't yeah. really work. But they're trying to impact climate change. They want to have a lot of tools in the arsenal in case in case climate change is as bad as some scientists believe it is they want to have a way of mitigating it you told one of our producers at this point it's pretty doubtful this is a viable terror threat right now I don't see uh, the, the pro I don't see the CIA yeah, I don't think that it's going to be an immediate threat. It's definitely something that's going to be a long-term, you know, decades down the line sort of thing. Well, there you go. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI. A method of seeding the stratosphere with particles that can help reflect the sun's heat in much the same way that volcanic eruptions do. An SAI program could limit global temperature increases, reducing some risks associated with higher temperatures and providing the world economy additional time to transition from fossil fuels. This process is also relatively inexpensive. The National Research Council estimates that a fully deployed SAI program would cost about $10 billion yearly. Now I could go on and on and on and on about the things that fascinate me, but rather than talk about them, I thought I'd stop here. Thank you, Senator. The Air Force has uh, gotten great value out of HARP in the past. We, we took over from the Navy and managed it and actually did a number of uh, experiment campaigns up there and uh, have finished our, our work that we're interested in doing up there. We've uh, moving on to other ways of uh, managing the ionosphere, which the HARP was really designed to do, was to inject energy into the ionosphere, be able to actually control it. And, uh, but that work is, has been completed. 
Uh, the Air Force uh, has maintained the site for other government agencies to use for several years now. And uh, with DARPA completing their project, that's our last government customer that we have in the site. We have uh, put out a call for other agencies that had interest in, uh, in managing the site or are taking it over, and including going out to uh, academia. International corporations are modifying our weather all the time, and they're modifying it in ways that cover thousands and thousands of square miles. Programs are impacting microclimates needed for our crops to survive and needed for pollination. The other issue is that a lot of times we're talking about mitigation for climate change. It's rather an undefined term at this period of time. And so what happens is that many times we're talking about artificially putting chemicals like sulfur or particulates into the atmosphere in what they call geoengineering schemes to reduce, supposedly, global warming. And if you take and you put up into our skies chemicals to reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth, you are going to begin to reduce crop production. Without the process of photosynthesis, whereby plants from direct sunlight gain the energy to grow, to produce crops, we are going to find ourselves, if we mitigate in that direction, impacting the crop production not only here in the United States, but worldwide. What you're seeing now, a lot of times, many scientists know, especially at NASA and in other areas, that the skies that we're seeing are not normal cloud formations. These are man-made. In California, the State Department of Health drinking water tests were examined between 1970 and this year, and we found unusual spiking in barium, aluminum, strontium, manganese, and all of these spiked at the same time in various drinking water supplies across the state of California and also in Arizona. So what's happening with these atmospheric tests is that aluminum, as one example, gets into the root systems of our trees, and it looks like the trees are dying of drought, but they're not. Many of our forests in Redding, California, and other areas are dying from warmer temperatures produced by persistent jet contrails, also impacting tree health and crop health. They know from scientific studies back in the 1970s that they deplete beneficial ozone in the atmosphere by releasing nitric acid. The death dumps, otherwise known as chemical trails, are being dropped and sprayed throughout the United States, in England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Europe, and I have personally seen them not only in the United States, but in Mexico and Canada. Birds are dying around the world. Fish are dying by the hundreds of thousands around the world. This is genocide. This is poison. This is murder by the United Nations. This element within our society is doing this must be stopped. I personally have observed the planes in Lincoln, Nebraska at the Air National Guard. They have no markings on them. They're huge bomber-like airplanes with no markings. This is a crime, crime against humanity, crime against America, crime against the citizens of this great country. What is wrong with Congress? This has an effect on their population and their people and their friends, and their relatives, and themselves. What's wrong with the pilots who are flying these airplanes? They're dumping this crap, this poison, on their own families. Somebody in Congress has to step forward and stop it now. Thank you, I'm Ted Gunderson. I conducted air sampling, I conducted soil sampling, and I was getting high levels of these contaminants. When I started asking the question again under a new commander, I never in my life thought I would have somebody look me in the face and tell me, is there something wrong with you? You've been looking really depressed lately. You know I can put you under mental evaluation for a, up to 120 days. Who would take care of your daughter? Because I was divorced at the time. As soon as I heard that, I knew. It validated everything I ever thought. And I thought, I've spent nine years of my life trying to protect human health. And here we are, violating law after law after law. Just sitting here, instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. And you ask yourself, if this is true and we are spraying the people, where are the pilots? Where are the people? I don't know if you pay attention, but look at Snowden. Look at, look at Manning. People don't come forward because these supposed whistleblower act protections that you have 
are not enforced, they're not supported, and they really don't exist. Geoengineering is occurring, it's been occurring, it is not new, and your tax dollars are funding this. So it is unethical every day for all the other people that are out there that work in preventive health or even physicians that aren't speaking about this, they need to. The biggest hurdle that we have is disinformation sites. I never say them, but I'm going to today so that you know if anyone ever gives these to you as a reference to debunk you, it's Metabunk and Contrail Science. Those are two websites that are ran by a government shill named Mick West. He is a computer gaming programmer who tries to tell you about persistent contrails. So somebody who isn't even credentialed in chemistry or physics or ecology, none of that, is trying to tell you that you're crazy. You have to understand that I have met people who used to be purposeful disinformation trolls, as we call them. These people are paid to get you on board to believe a website or an article. So I just want everyone to know and understand that of all things, of all the freedoms that we are losing, geoengineering is the number one issue that we are facing. Because you can have guns and money and you can have everything. If you don't have food and water and you are dying of respiratory or neurological illnesses, what does it matter? So you've heard about vaccines and you'll hear you know, about smart meters and you'll hear about other issues. These are all systemic effects. We are getting overexposed to toxins. People will tell you fluoride's in the water, but it's not a lot. It is a lot because you're getting it everywhere in your food, water that you drink, and you're getting your vaccines. Our bodies cannot metabolize these toxins. There's the debate. Is it a condensation trailer or a chemical trail, something with an additive in it? And I couldn't bite the chemical trail issue for a long time. Give me a reason, give me a motive. And so I started time-lapsing the sky. And there was this one day where I saw a series of planes go by, but one trail persisted and the others didn't. And as that trail slowly faded away, two other planes came along. One hit the exact end of it and another went through the middle. How could these planes be aware of, or better yet, even be remotely concerned with what's going on with the debris from another plane? Mm. And as I, as I time-lapsed this guy more and more and more and in higher and higher resolution as the technology improved, it was a godsend. Because you could see even the little planes were part of the bigger program. So they had to be at, at a precise place at an exact time to reveal a disturbance in a trail that may have only been in the sky 10 seconds. It went beyond correlation. And we're dealing with a massive, massive ballet in the sky. Yeah. We've got a program that is loose on the planet and is this guise of climate change, but it is this program we're seeing at work. As I became more aware of technologies, I looked at these clouds, at these patterns with different eyes, with a different understanding. And what I've learned is that these chemtrails help the technology align these patterns, align these vibrational structures which direct our weather today. Um, when I found out about this first, I couldn't believe that I had never seen it before because I'm from County Wexford, which is known as the sunny southeast in Ireland. And we have always boasted the highest sunshine hours in the, in the country. And we are also underneath one of the busiest air corridors in the world. When I started to find out about chemtrails, I started to look up and I realized that yeah, these trails do linger all day and uh, they go horizon to horizon and you look to your old photographs and you don't see these kind of trails. So I suppose when the penny dropped was when I saw what in the world are they spraying. That's really when uh, this whole thing kind of made sense to me because it was explained in a documentary. People knew what they were talking about and this made a lot of sense. You know, this is a government program to control the weather. And if you think about it, if you want to dominate and control the planet, this is the ultimate weapon to, to do that. So the Irish media now are normalizing weaponized air as a reality that we must get used to. They are blaming car emissions and coal pollution, but there's, there's no mention of the elephant in the room, the hundreds of millions of tons of substances being sprayed into our atmosphere every year, like aluminium oxide, which David Keith and other geoengineering proponents are proposing spraying into our skies. They will never admit these programs are going on, but we know they are going on because 2004, the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK conducted an investigation into cabin air quality and one of the peak materials found was aluminium. So what the hell is aluminium doing floating around up at cruising altitude? So now Monsanto miraculously have an aluminium resistant seed that can grow in aluminium contaminated soil. Why would they have such a thing unless they knew of a problem that was down the line or already happening? 
Last year in 2015, a study came out of Keele University in the UK and bees were found to have had massive high quantities of aluminium in their brains. This is a big problem. We need bees to keep the food chain sustained and to keep it alive. And now Monsanto have recently bought a bee research company called Biologics in 2012. And they have genetically modified a bee that can only pollinate Monsanto crops. And also, this bee is resistant to all pesticides. So why would they want to design such a Frankenstein creation unless they knew of a problem that already existed or a problem that was in the pipeline? Dementia now is the biggest killer in women in the UK. And what's the main cause of dementia? Aluminium accumulation in the brain cells. We are in the fight of our lives. All sources needed for life to exist are under direct attack from these programs. Oxygen, sunlight and water. Once you know about this, you have a duty of care to get involved. As a caretaker of this planet, we must all come together to stop these programs because we can do it. But once you find out this is going on, you understand that the air you breathe is being compromised. Things don't get any worse than that. You're standing at the end of the plank, what else do you do? You gotta take action, otherwise you are condoning what's going on. Silence is compliance. So um, we got to speak out. We spend a lot of time outside looking up at the sky and not a lot of people do that anymore. March 14th, 2014 in Eureka, California, I was driving the vehicle with my two kids and we were watching this chemtrail for about maybe like five minutes it had been going. And I noticed that there was this large flash that lit up the entire sky similar to what lightning would do. So we're driving towards the sunset and the drone was coming this way and it came over and about there, that's when we saw the light and then it went straight down from that angle. The difference that I'm finding when I see a drone spraying compared to an airplane spraying is when the drone sprays, it seems that it's more of an upward angle from the ground to the sky as if it was launched from right below where it was. And with the plane sprayers, it seems like they go from one side of the horizon to the other side. The reason that uh, the people probably stand on the sidelines is because, you know, they don't really want to stand out. And uh, I don't mind standing out. That's part of my personality since forever. So, you know, everybody's in their car looking down, watching the news. I'm outside looking up. I've become aware and it seems to me like more people need to be aware or should want to be aware. My name's uh, Jack Falsrock. No, no, Maja Maui. No, I, I grew up on the east side of Mount Shasta. We went out and hunt and gathered all of our food all the time. That's when I first started noticing that, the, that something was wrong with the earth. Then I started seeing things in the sky that was not supposed to be there. And then I seen that what caused those things was the planes that was flying over and they were polluting the sky. And I was, and I was wondering why, why did they don't they care about the sky? What I noticed, you know, is, is this really strange weather, you know, it really disrupts everything. You know, I noticed that too, you know, how when, the, when it gets cold sometimes, um, and then it gets hot, and then it gets cold and it gets hot. You know, it disrupts this, this environment here, you know. I mean, anybody that understands when they grow things, you know, they, they know that they, the weather can't change like that. You don't have to be a scientist to understand that. And when you disrupt that, when you keep putting these clouds in that, in between the earth and, and the moon, you're gonna disrupt the whole world. You're gonna disrupt man, you're gonna disrupt all these animals. You know, that's why it's not, it's not good to change the weather. The weather's how it's supposed to be. It's like what they're spraying over there with, their, with the mosquitoes. They say those things so they can scare people so they can continue doing that. And then that's all they do is scare these people. So they go, oh, we got to do this, we got to do this. And there's nothing to be afraid of in here. Everything was created beautiful. Are you not happy, you know? Go some other earth. Go over there, you know? Get on your plane and go somewhere else, you know? They stopped spraying the chemicals. We can heal. We will heal ourselves just like the earth will heal. If, we, if they stop those, if they stop the chemicals before it's too late. And people really began to understand you know, really, really understand. I know that people accept the sky the way it is now because they're so used to it. And, and it's really sad. We should stop using all the chemicals that we use and, and trying to control the things that we shouldn't even control. Quit using the chemicals. Quit using the chemicals in the sky. You're gonna wake up one morning and you can't breathe, then what are you gonna do? 
We have freedom of information in both British Columbia and Canada. So I first inquired from the province because I was relatively close to the people there. So I thought I could probably find out more from it than I might from Canada. However, I did get a quick response from the province saying basically they knew nothing about it and they couldn't help me. It took a long time for me to get a response from the federal government. I requested the information through the Freedom of Information legislation in about 2013, I think it was. And it was 2014 in March when I finally got a response. I got 47 pages of which 10 were blanked out completely and six or eight had uh, comments, uh, this information cannot be provided for you under section whatever of the Freedom of Information Act. So I didn't get all the information. There's a lot out there that they haven't told us, but they told me enough that it basically confirmed for me and for all of those that the report was provided to that yes, it was happening. And I think there needs to be more an awareness among the people. The more we talk about chemtrails, what's happening, we're being rained upon with aluminum, barium, strontium, all of that. And the effects, of course, we're feeling here as well. It's recognizing the report from the federal government of Canada that this will affect geoengineering, as they call it, chemtrails, solar radiation, whatever you want to call it will affect climate, it's reflecting back the sunlight, but it also recommends or recognizes in the report that it's going to have different effects in different places. The moment governments admit that this is happening because of what it is they're doing, there's a liability, there's a responsibility, and that for them is a problem. So as long as the people are relatively quiet and they're more interested in a football game, a baseball game, or whatever it is today, um, as I said earlier, create an awareness. And I point to the sky every time I see the chemtrails and whomever with me will know that those are chemtrails. If I'm not doing it, my wife will certainly do it. Lillian points it out every time to everyone, and that needs to happen. I guess for the most part, the populace still thinks that governments can't do that to us. It's impossible that it's happening. Mm -hmm. If the government came out, or the bureaucracy or, or whatever came out and said, we're uh, very involved in genetically modified foods, or we're creating chemtrails, which means that you're being uh, rained upon with aluminum or whatever, that would probably not go over too well. That would be politically very unpopular. You would have an outcry, you would have a protest, you would have a mini revolution. So they're gonna try and keep it down as much as possible. You're not gonna see a whole lot of politicians or bureaucrats jumping on it. The pressure is gonna have to continue on. There's gotta be a lot of it. It obviously, the result will be uh, enormous public awareness. Once aware, they're going to fight it, they're going to be on our side, we're going to be together on the issue. That's important. I first got into chemtrails when I had some solar panels fitted onto my roof and I noticed on the days that the sun was out, it was great. Four kilowatts, happy days. And then I noticed some days it got down to one or two kilowatts when actually the weather forecast forecast sun. I'd never taken much interest in the weather until I was earning money out of it. And then when you find out you've earned only a fifth of what you should have earned according to the weather forecast, then something wasn't quite right. And I'd never heard the word before, chemtrails. And then when I went and looked it up on YouTube, I couldn't believe that somebody would actually spray the sky with lines, um, deliberately. And yet, as the weeks went by, I found out absolutely it's true when they were doing it. And it was costing me money. There's other subjects that have come along in the meantime when I thought, is there anything that could be done to stop this? And having found other subjects, people like Wilhelm Reich's name was coming up, and even later Tesla. Wilhelm Reich, very, very clever person in as much that he realized there's an energy in life that's very, very powerful and important and is related to good health. And after many years of investigation, he found out there were some fantastic properties to this, and he called it Orgon, which is related to ether. Other people came along, people like um, Trevor Constable, um, who looked at generating and changing the weather with certain pieces of equipment. 
And this isn't the use of chemicals, this is actually the use of equipment which reacts with ether and it's perfectly 100% natural. Um, Willem Reich actually found out there was amazing cures with ether and one of them was cancer. He actually cured the people that the hospitals discarded and set, put them on the scrap heap basically and says we can't cure you. And Willem Reich virtually cured every single one of them. He understood what ether was about. And how he found out about the cancer is that when you change the frequencies of DNA, the DNA loses all its instructions. And that means that the DNA grows distorted and it can't grow the way that it should grow. In other words, if it's part of your skin or it's supposed to be part of your kidney, it grows into a deformed piece of the body that shouldn't even be there. Um, but by correcting the frequency, the DNA goes back to grow how it should do. And that's one of the amazing things he was working on. Tesla proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that he can actually tap into the energy which is already there. And what I mean by that is when you have two opposing potentials, um, you can tap in the difference between the two potentials and that's your energy that you, you're actually creating. Now Tesla said something that um, I thought was very interesting. I only found this out recently. He talked about ether and he made this statement that ether controls magnetism, electricity and all energy. Now to actually come out and say that he must have had some basis as to why we know that Tesla based all his works on facts and many, many experiments. And of course, we use many of Tesla's technology today, both in electricity, magnetism, etc. And so we're in a position now where we're looking at equipment that Wilhelm Reich manufactured and made. We're looking at um, the way that he used it and he generated it. Now, Wilhelm Reich, he actually was called into places like California when it hadn't rained for months and months. In fact, some of these poor farmers were being bankrupt. He actually went to a place where it hadn't rained for many years. And after about six weeks, he did start to develop a very small amount of rain, but a moisture came into the area where all the plants started to flourish. According to what his daughter said, that area continued to flourish for another 50 years. The other thing that Willem Wright noticed is the texture of the rocks changed from being crumbly to having some body back to it again. So when we talk about ether, we're not talking about just weather modification or health to the body. Ether must be some kind of energy which controls, as Tesla said, everything. It's like the link that ties and controls everything together, whether it's energy, magnetism, or electricity. I would love to be able to use ether to bin one, two, three, four, five thousand square miles of chem trailing. That would be fantastic. Before they use it for all the other agendas. And if we could do that, um, happy days. Because uh, that's what a lot of people are looking forward to. A day where all this crap is not in their control anymore. And I believe if we could master this, Ether will do exactly that. Tonight we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the sickness behavior. We're going to talk about why people are having these problems. We're going to talk about how the trails are affecting us. Because they are now. There's no doubt. Even the EPA said so. They just made mention of it about, uh, well, a couple months ago, actually, last summer. They admitted it. The EPA said, it's affecting me. 888-673-3700. That's 888-673-3700. I'm Clay Lewis. You're listening to Ground Zero, and we'll be back. In the United Kingdom, they just published their mortality statistics for 2016. And you'd expect, okay, what's top three? Cancer, heart attack, stroke, always has been. Number one, dementia. Number one, which of course includes uh, Alzheimer's, which is caused by aluminum. They found carbon nanotubes in Parisian lungs. Uh, in Turin, half of the children had uh, severe DNA damage from nanoparticulates. And there's a study that came out recently showing how nanoparticles interfere with the nuts and bolts of the internal workings of your cells and cause rheumatoid arthritis, which is just one of the very many autoimmune diseases we're all coming down with. We don't need any more evidence. We need to get this out into the public consciousness and say, oh, hell no. I wanted to let you know that there was a study that was released back in the summer of 2016, the Environmental Protection Agency, they declared that emissions from jet engines endanger the health of human beings and the environment. They pointed out, they were investigating the possibility that lingering contrails, this is what they called them, 
Lingering contrails contribute to dangerous heat waves, more powerful storms, lengthening of fire seasons, and other dangerous consequences. But well, there's a new study about air pollution that's revealing that, once again, the particulate, the aluminum and barium that we talk about in the trails, is creating dementia. For older women, breathing air that is heavily polluted by metals and other sources of fine particulates nearly doubles the likelihood of developing dementia and the cognitive effects of air pollution are dramatically more pronounced in women who carry a genetic variant known as APO, that's A-P-O-E-E-4, which puts them at higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. There are so many things going on, and it's because these nanoparticles are disrupting the workings of our cells, our bodies attack ourselves, and it goes nuts. But just concentrating on what's being sprayed is only half the story. The electromagnetic aspect of this is devastating. The Russians were using the woodpecker program back in the 80s. Could they, they could they change it? Right here. Yeah, yeah, because it's very long wavelength. It travels a very long distance. And it's such simple technology. Our body's resonant frequency is five hertz. All you have to do is just point that at someone and it's, yeah. If you pick someone up and shake them at five times a second, they'll fall apart. There's so much research on the cognitive, physiological, and other effects of electromagnetic radiation on our bodies and our minds. And, you know, put a burrito in the microwave, you know, it does something. You'll often find you, you just be going about along with your day and then suddenly like, bam, you're extremely tired. You just have to sleep. And, and you'll find a lot of people at the same time will have those things. You'll have people getting similar mm -hmm like muscle spasms in different parts of the body all over the place. I mean, it's full spectrum warfare. I mean, the electromagnetic, the spraying, all these sort of things. In Scotland last year, between 2014 and 2015, the death rate from respiratory failure went up like 14% in one year. That's statistically significant. I mean, why aren't, aren't they asking, uh, why, you know, is this massive jump? Italy's death rate overall went up 11%. This is carnage. So when you're looking at the spraying, it could be private contractors doing it, sure. weather modification, it could be a number of things that they're doing. Geoengineering, of course, Matt, uh, you know, he, he was the one that introduced me to the idea of geoengineering mm -hmm. being used and, and doing the studies of geoengineering. That's what we talked about the last time you were on the program. Well, you heard that now they're, they're, uh, the bees are an endangered species. Exactly. I, yeah. was, uh, I was reading about that the other day, that uh, they now have made them an endangered species, and that's frightening. Because I mean, before we had the, what do they call that, hive... Um, you know, colony like, collapse disorder. Yeah, colony collapse, uh, colony, uh, collapse disorder. Uh, they said the colony collapse disorder could be because of, you know, Roundup, Monsanto, you, you name off all these things. But think about this. The bees are dying of the same type of problems that we're having, and that is dehydration, not getting enough water, not having enough water in our bodies, uh, having diseases that are creating this sick behavior that we're having, and the bees get it too. Even people who have good night's sleep are not feeling it. They wake up tired, they wake up dragging, and so what else could it be but something environmental, something uh, toxic that we're being exposed to? It's got to be above government because it's global. Right. They're doing it all over the world. Yeah. China, Russia, everywhere. And then that's the thing. If we don't know who, then we don't know all of the answers for them. And they can't make a solid opinion. One of my biggest frustrations is the line, they wouldn't do that to us. <laughs> I've heard that too. Why would they do that to us? Because they have families too. And I tell them, well, you know, I have a genetic disorder that makes me prone to cancer. And why? Because they were testing nuclear weapons in the West Deserts of Nevada. St. George, Cedar City area in Utah. My family was subjected to that radiation, which caused some DNA problems, and it got passed down to me. And my son. Yeah, and my son. They did that because they felt that that was more important than the lives of people. Spend a few bucks, uh, get your rainwater analysis, you can get your hair analyzed. And I have footage of these sprayers, and, they're, and, and they show up on flight radar. I don't know any airline that does not spray. They aren't told, oh, by the way, turn this switch when you get to a certain point. It's, it's all done centrally. There's plenty of patents where the substance actually gets injected into the exhaust. I mean, there's a US Navy patent called the Powder Contrail. There's so much freaking evidence. It's insane. Technocracy, this crackpot idea dreamed up in the 1930s. They wanted to replace the economic system with an energy based thing. But like, if you have a gold based economy, you know how much a loaf of bread is worth and compared to the amount of gold there is. But with energy, you have to know how much energy is being stored, transferred, whatever, at all times, hence smart meters, smart 
every freaking thing. Reject it. The official line on this whole thing is, oh, we're all gonna die from global warming and we might just have to spray sulfates into the sky to reduce global warming. David Keith, Ken Calder, and Alan Roebuck are the three main guys who go out to do this stuff. They'll only talk about sulfates. But uh, their own papers say, actually, sulfates don't work. They stick together, they fall out of the sky. Instead, you've got to use nanoparticulate aluminum, barium, strontium, magnetite, and so on. And this character, David's research, according to US Code 50, uh, section 1520A, I think. It's legal to spray chemical and biological warfare on a, on a civilian population as long as you call it research. So it's banned as warfare, but you can do it in your own populations. So I think all the, all the spraying is generally done by people's own militaries. What they're doing is they're establishing a geoengineering governance regime. It's a self-proclaimed regime. They asked for papers to identify things like, should we even involve the UN? Should we take into consideration human health impacts? What role will public perception and opinion play while we establish this solar geoengineering governance regime? Self-titled regime. So Patrick and I, we independently um, submitted papers. I hired a PhD. My paper delved into um, the human rights aspect, that we have the right to environmental decision-making participation. Both of our papers were, of course, rejected. It is their plan to do full-scale deployment. They claim that all of the research that we've been seeing, these grid patterns, are research. They're admitting to it. The chemtrails, the geoengineering, the solar radiation management, Okay, and now you can even look up the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative, SRMGI. Okay, it's an initiative to govern their solar radiation management, which is chemtrails, which is geoengineering. So these people are meeting, 24 scientists behind closed doors, to develop the plan for the regime to take hold to go full-scale deployment. Some days don't have chemtrails, right? Some days are clear. And really, the more clear days you get in a row, the more likelihood it is that you're going to get a grid pattern coming up. But this irregular pattern of appearance where you not only have no lines in the sky, but you also don't have the air traffic, okay? Listeners, feel free to look up at your sky. Look at that air traffic. See those days where there's nothing going on. And this irregularity in the appearance is, it's the clue. It's the first clue for the, for the newbies. Chemtrails are also called solar geoengineering. It's also called solar radiation management. It's also called stratospheric aerosol injections. Okay, and what they like to do is they like to confuse us with the terminology. It's all one thing, right? It's all chemtrails. It's all geoengineering. It's all solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol injections. Whatever word you want to give it, it's all treason. It's very, very obvious that chemtrail does not behave like an actual cloud formation. It forms out and fades into a milky haze. All right, irregular pattern of appearance, the number of trails seen simultaneously at a given time. When you're sitting out there and it's a normal day and then all of a sudden a dozen planes show up and grid the sky, whereas you've seen three planes all day, something is going on there. That's it. It's that simple. How come all of a sudden all the planes show up at once and zigzag the sky? We got broken trails, all right? Things are going on where they're mixing chemicals in the sky. They're using the atmosphere as a laboratory. That is a quote from NASA. Using the atmosphere as a laboratory. Okay, the exhaust is often coming where the engines are not. Okay, this wakes the people up. In 1983, we had 50 companies, right? 90% of the media. 1983, 50 companies encapsulated the 90% of the media. Now it's been consolidated down to six companies. Those six companies are owned by just a couple families. Everything is controlled. They hand a script to the entire nation. And your local broadcaster is reading something that was planned to build your mental construct to control the way you think about everything. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, right? Especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. Civil society actors that, quote, manifest the will of the public. They call these astroturf because Almost everything has been co-op. They've contemplated how they were going to convince us that we need solar geoengineering to block out the sun. They say, society is lousy at strategy, but we are not. 
A few suggested that to shift the conversation in productive ways, geoengineering will be characterized publicly as a terrible choice. We'll start the conversation by introducing them this problem and we'll tell them that it's a horrible idea. Problem, reaction, solution. So here they come out immediately. Geoengineering, a horrible idea. Geoengineering climate fixes could harm billions. During this short time frame, Forbes magazine, Washington Post, chemtrails are not real, showing a picture of chemtrails. So if you're new to this, you're being educated by your trusted news sources, okay? And they're telling you there's nothing to see up there, don't worry. But wait, wait in six months, they're gonna tell you they've got a cure for global warming and it's identical to what they have proven to you does not exist. Geoengineers to spray sun reflecting chemicals from a balloon. They think that we're so dumb that we see the lines coming out of the planes, we see these rare halos going around the sun, and then all they have to say in the newspaper is, well, we're gonna use balloons, don't worry. Geoengineering gets green light from federal scientists 2017. March 25th, we've got new clouds for you. 12 of them. 12 new clouds? And how does this correspond to this entire agenda push? And the name for these vapor trails, Homo Mutatus which literally means man-made. The World Meteorological Organization has decided to add 11 new cloud classifications. That's to their international cloud atlas, and this is a big deal because it is the first time they've added anything in 30 years. Forget being on cloud nine, we are on cloud 12 because that's how many new types of clouds have been added to this historic update coming from meteorologists. I'm a little biased, right? Exciting stuff, guys. All right, so the new types include the Vladis or roll cloud, which has been designated as a whole new species. You can see it gets its name from this long horizontal tube-like shape. Next one up, we have the cavum or the hole punch cloud. This big circular gap is sometimes caused by aircraft taking off and landing. Very easy to see, right? Makes sense there. And we also have the sparatus. These are gorgeous. It's actually my favorite. It's kind of looking like it waves while you're underwater. I mean, these are actually beautiful. I mean, check these out. And then finally, we also have the big surfer waves of the Fluctus cloud. So beautiful, right? There's just a sample of the new additions that we have. Meteorologists, sky watchers, daydreamers, we're all geeking out, guys. The meteorologists are all part of that same program. They're all getting handed a script and they're told to read it and they have no choice. And already, it's time for governance, okay? This is something that they just shoved down our throats for the past few months and they say they're gonna be doing it in the future and they say don't worry that it's not real six months ago. Now. They're already talking about how are they gonna govern it? They're, they're pushing this agenda full speed, full speed ahead. They're already talking about how to govern something that we're still slowly waking up to that they're gonna be doing it to us publicly. This very small group of globalists claim that they have the exclusive rights to saving us and that we don't get it and they do. This is all of our skies. This is all of our air. This is our children's future. Everybody is involved here, all right? There was a time when people got pissed and they did something about it and they made things change, okay? They know that they can program you through social media, okay, and we can't let that happen. It's up to us to carry this information forward. It's up to us to be the change. And if we don't do it, we're not gonna have any sun. Thank you. Or in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Geoengineering, chemtrails, forced vaccinations, population control, weather modification, war games, we have not given consent. You cannot spray the atmosphere with toxic chemicals and expect no ramifications. These chemicals go into our food, our air and our water supply. Ill effects of these have been recorded as headaches, flus, breathing problems, skin problems and my major concern is Alzheimer's disease. Aluminium causes nerve damage. Fluoride in the water works with aluminium in the air to 
across into our brains. At this moment, about 24,700 young people around the age of 30 and above have Alzheimer's. In the next 10 years, 400,000 people in Australia will have dementia. It is now the third leading cause of death in Australia. About 10 years ago, I did a degree in environmental management. It's concerning to me that in that short time, we were brainwashed to believe in population control, that our earth could not sustain itself if we didn't intervene. The earth has enough resources for everyone. We need to change our thinking, but also change our actions. If you have never heard of these terms before, then please start looking at the sky and make your own decisions.